Hello, and welcome once again to Diminishing Returns. Uh, we're back on Bond this week, which is very exciting, particularly as this could be the first time ever that one of these two other guys likes a Bond film more than I do. I'm <laughs> Calvin, and here, as always, on the Diminishing Returns podcast are Sol Hello. and Alan. Hello. So, a bit of uh, background on this one. Um, obviously, Casino Royale came out and was quite a big hit. Uh, critically, commercially, everyone sort of really liked this new direction that the films were taking, and so... Wow! They haven't made it shit for once! It's like Jason Bourne, but he's British. It's like they've made a real film with writing and directing and camera work. What a novel idea! So... <laughs> So, I think that the impulse going into this one was certainly to take all of those things that they read about in the good reviews, about the character development and no more gadgets, cute money penny aren't there, all that kind of stuff, and just turn the dial on that up to 11, which is why we have uh, Mark Forster. I genuinely didn't know where you were going with that sentence. <laughs> I thought you, I, like, you could have... You could have just as easily been going, they took all the positive things from the reviews, the character development, the writing, and they wiped their ass with it. And <laughs> well, away. I well, I'm I'm talking about the you know, the impulse behind the you know, the uh, decisions that are made, whether or not it paid off or not, whether or not they were good decisions, I think we'll get into, but Mark Forster, is this our first time talking about him on the podcast? Has there been any conversation about World War Z on yeah, this he's, show? The name has definitely, definitely been mentioned before. But yes, I think this might be the first time we've really got into it about this man. This oh, interesting, man. because because um, he is very much the start of after him. They got Sam Mendes on for a couple of Bond films, so... It, you know, big scarf wearing artiste sort of directors <laughs> who are going to go and press interviews and talk about the character development and all that kind of stuff instead of big explosions and boobs and stuff. Uh, and I think that there is a place for all of that. But I'm just curious to dig a bit deeper into this director first, because Sol, I, you're obviously a huge zombie fan. And I, remind me where you stand on World War Z, because... Mm. yeah. I'm just curious to know if he has destroyed things close to both of our hearts, or if it's just me. I think that we probably have a real affinity over Mark Forster, because, I mean, I guess he's no he's no Paul W.S. Anderson, but I, there, there is part <laughs> of me that wants to say Mark Forster is my least favourite director. Ooh. And I think it's because I don't know how he's done it. It's like he's bamboozled the right... <laughs> people in Hollywood and now he's got enough credits behind him that, you know, it's the Emperor's New Clothes and they don't dare say, hang on, does this guy understand filmmaking? I know that people ultimately, you know, reviews were relatively positive for World War Z, but I, I think it is an appalling piece of excrement. Um, mm. Even if I take it as something that has nothing to do with the book, which is what that film is, it, it has nothing to do with the book. Um, it's it's awful. Um, I guess the point I'm leading to is that I think Mark Forster is a bad director, and specifically, I think he sucks at action scenes. He cannot direct action. Mm. His action is all classic shaky hand, too close to see what's going on. Um, and that was kind of my feelings going mm. into Quantum of Solace. Well, allow me to quote from my notes, one of my early notes, close-up shaky cam bullshit, uh, is what I wrote. <laughs> so, yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, yeah, and look, I don't want to tip my hat too clearly here, but my first note that I made, of several pages of notes, is horribly shot action, Mark Forster, too close and shaky, and yuck. <laughs> mm. So, anyway, um, yeah, Calvin, I, I do feel like we might have, yeah, perhaps the most kind of the enemy of my friend is my enemy kind of thing going <laughs> with Mark Forster. Oh, brilliant. I hope we do get onto World War Z at some point then in the future. That'd be yeah, fun. I've seen that once. Um, I don't remember having terribly strong opinions on, on it, but I did think it was poor. Um, Alan, do you have any strong feelings about this guy? No. Interesting, okay. Uh, my next point, before we start talking about the film uh, in a bit more detail, is that this is the first, like, proper 
sequel. Like, you can't come into this, I don't think, unless you've seen the previous one. It'd make absolutely no sense. Um, it's been some months since we saw Casino Royale and talked about it. Did w- did that present a problem for either of you coming into yes. this now? Yes, yes, ah, yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. I had no concept, other than Jeffrey Wright and Judy Dench, I had no idea which characters were people from the last film and which ones weren't. I got to the point where I was just assuming that everyone was from the last film, but then it turned out that one of them wasn't, the main villain wasn't in the last film, which does beg the question of why we're following such a nothing bland villain if he's like brand new for this film and also but you know like if you're gonna bring back every single actor and character from the previous film and you know not give us anything new of of value it's a shame that like the only two good characters in the previous film both died isn't it and therefore can't (laughs) come back because you know what a what a relief mads mickelson would have been in this film just to Mm. give it something and and ava green you know like just yeah, she's good. Well, here, here's the thing, right? I, I I recognized at the beginning that they were kind of continuing the story. Then there's a whole film, and then at the end mm. they do something with that boyfriend. Uh, and the middle yeah. bit was completely disconnected, as far as I could tell. At one point, M says something like, "Why are you making this personal? You clearly you're out to get revenge." I was like, "This isn't connected to any of that, is it? What are yeah. you on about?" I, this is one of my biggest disappointments with the film. I was under the impression that this was a direct sequel, and it, it you know, was like part two of Casino Royale. It isn't any more than the previous film where James Bond's wife got killed, and then the next film opens with him killing loads of people in a revenge mission. Like, it just, it, it uses, like, the previous film as a loose tangential springboard for, like, five minutes at the start, then we have a musical, you know, opening credit scene. Then it's just a completely disconnected load of, load of action bollocks. And then at the very end, they kind of go, yeah, this guy, by the way. Well, I, I mean, I agree. I'm on the same page with you on this. I think it's, uh, and I think it's tough when they, ha- they, they want to make a Bond film. They want to have a villain with a big Machiavellian scheme and all this kind of stuff and a henchman and all that. But they also want to do this personal vendetta mission for Bond. But they're not quite sure where to pin that like who who is the person that he's out to get revenge against exactly it's vespa's boyfriend presumably uh, who wasn't really dead um by the end of it but he's such a non-entity for so much of the film it's mm. you know, the fact that we spend so much of it with this green character and his scheme involving water and bolivia and this general it's all it's very messy um, and this yeah. was made during the writer's strike, I should point out, yeah. so Daniel Craig and Mark Forster were writing the script on the set together. Well, that, so. That's why I, part of what appealed to me about this film was I knew it was made during the writer's strike, and my understanding was that the very concept of the film was born out of necessity, because they couldn't, you know, come up with a brand new Bond idea properly on the fly. I just thought, like, oh, they're basically just riffing this thing off the back of the previous film, but... I got bored while I was watching it and started reading into it, and apparently this was a concept that was being developed whilst Casino Royale was being made, is it? You know, ahead of the writer's strike, it was always, like, the intention. Like, I like the idea of of people having to make the best of what they've got and, you know, create a James Bond film with limited resources, and that's it doesn't really seem like that's what this was. It just seemed like there's less dialogue sequences because they didn't have any writers. <laughs> oh, nobody can do the puns. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, the puns in this one, the jokey bits in this one are even by Bond standards, they are weak. <laughs> there aren't many, are there? I, I mean, I can't think of any. The one that springs to mind is Daniel Craig hands the Bond girl to a, a guy, and she's like passed out or something, and he mm. he says like she's seasick, and it's like mm, that scene has the grammar of being a joke. But <laughs> but it's not actually funny or a gag. It's just Bond lying. It's it... okay. Well, um, let, let's can we get into the film and just talk about the first uh, chunk of it, the first yes. act, because it is kind of one massive action sequence for like the first like yeah. fifteen twenty minutes of it, which I'm all for. But well... maybe maybe get a director who can do action. You know. Well, yes. I mean, why? I, I find car chases very boring. Uh, there's something about that specifically, like even more boring than them running over the roofs and stuff like that. And I think it can be done well, but 
this isn't it. It's it's your most basic by the numbers post born world car chase sequence, isn't it? No, no. I think it's worse than that. I think it's <laughs> below your most basic. Like most basic would be competent, but I think this is badly put together as a scene. It's, it's sh- shot too closely and shaky. You can't get a good sense of the um, you know position of things and how it relates. It, it, I think it's quite a badly constructed action scene. Oh, there's no sense of geography through any action sequence in this, I don't think. Just following the A to B to C, and I've, I've had many conversations with Bond fans about this, and, you know, I'm going to be pointing out things to you guys that happen in the edit, because obviously I, I had this thing in editing software, I've been through it, sort of frame by frame in some instances, <laughs> and I have... And on, no, I mean, honestly, there are some... There's, there are things in it that I didn't realise for years that you think would be fairly big issues but anyway i talked to some bond fans about this and particularly this opening sequence i've heard you know the defense of it is that it's supposed to make you feel like you're in a car crash which i if it's to to replicate an unpleasant experience (laughs) oh dear that is a that is a reach and a hard <laughs> yeah. Bond fans. But I think, I'll tell you what my issue with it is, and more often than not, in a Bond car chase or action sequence or something, it builds up to a showcase, you know, a big show-stopping stunt, or there's some trick with the car, the gadgets, it goes underwater, or there's <laughs> something. But yeah, you know, there is something like that, whereas this is just like, the thing is, did you catch how, you know how his door comes off? And then he's no longer bulletproof, so he can be shot at. Did mm. you catch how the door comes off? Did he, did he accidentally reverse into a lamppost? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the the lor- a lorry hit the wall, and then a protrusion came out of the lorry, and he slammed into the lorry, and then that broke off the, um, the door. But mm. it's all such a flurry of shots that y- I didn't even know what was going on, I... I think it's a nice gag that we end the car chase and it's the bloke from the last film in the boot. I think that's a nice payoff. But then um, but then M's here and they're going to interrogate uh, this Mr. White chap. Mm. Um, and again, then we just go into another big chase of an action sequence, which is just to talk about the filmmaking itself. Because I think this just big, like this is like textbook how not to c- craft an action scene to me with all of these shots going to just random people in the crowd that never play into anything. And yeah. we see the horses kind of gearing up to race and it's like, okay, yes, I get it. I get there's some kind of metaphor, some kind of symbolism going on here, but it's all... Just oh, such... I didn't get the metaphor. I thought it was just let's film a local ethnic event. Well, I think and it's just, both... just intercut it because it's both actiony. Ah, uh, is the metaphor action? Mm. Did you um, catch that M is shot at here and narrowly I, avoids well, a bullet? I thought M was shot. Like I wrote yeah. notes down. Like what the fuck? M just got shot, and Bond <laughs> is like more concerned with running after this guy than tending to her wounds. Mm. And then she turns up, like, a scene or two later, fine. And I was like, what? M's yeah. here? Judy Dench has a bulletproof brazier. And then uh, <laughs> and then Bond says something like, they nearly shot you, but they shot the other guy. And I was like, oh, right, okay. That wasn't very clearly conveyed, again, with this cinematography and direction and editing. Mm. Th- there were two frames in there where she's standing in front of, like, Mr. White's on, like, a drip or something, and it's on, like, a a pole next to him. And there are two frames of, like, sparks on the pole. And that's from that we're supposed to take the... He he was almost shooting her, but the bullet deflected from the pole. (laughs) Um, But how it's shot, because she kind of, like, falls back. Yeah, she goes down like she's been shot. Well, it's it's confusing because she doesn't go down, but because it's so ineptly filmed and the camera's like positioning up, she just steps back and that makes it look like she's fallen down. It's just, I mean, and then there are a couple of shots in there of her completely in shadow running away. And I'm talking like six frames here, five frames there. It's really poorly crafted. Uh, it's because the, the, the stunt the double was six foot time. two. <laughs> well, th- this is it. Like, how much of a how much of it is them covering up that? Because I don't know how physically able Judy Dench was, but <laughs> I, yeah, it's like that kind of shit you need to make clear. Yeah. And then just all of the intercutting, it's really distracting. This horse thing going on, it's just, yeah, it's just a flurry of <laughs> nonsense. I, I I do want to talk, though, about the opening title sequence, because it's obviously such a big part of Bond. Oh, right. 
Oh, just be just right before that, uh, he opens the boot. There's a man in the boot, and now am I crazy or was there a freeze frame moment? Yes. So it wasn't just my copy skipping on the disc. Nope. <laughs> That was nope. weird. I actually had to go back to make sure I hadn't imagined it and that it mm. had actually done a big end of the film in the 1980s freeze frame moment. <laughs> <laughs> it is really odd. And again, just kind of shows, I guess they just didn't have the extra, what, second that they needed to <laughs> yeah. sort of work with the music cue. It, yeah. It, it's like that pigeon double take where they just reverse the footage. It's the same thing. <laughs> they were just stretching the footage out. It wasn't meant to look paused. It was just, yeah. <laughs> And so, yes, we kick in with... Now, I, I quite like the White Stripe. Yeah, I, I don't mind a bit of White Stripes. Uh, but I don't think it's the appropriate sound for this <laughs> style of song. How do you feel about Alicia Keys, though? Is that the woman who is singing on this? <laughs> yes, because this is only... It's not the White Stripes. It is Jack White of the White Stripes. Right. Um, so they only got half of them. And instead of Meg White, is that her name? They put Alicia Meg Keys Stripes. in it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who she is, so she seemed uh, fine. She was singing. So. I would have rather they got Jack Black and Alicia Locks to do the song, <laughs> personally. <laughs> I would actually love Jack Black to do a James Bond theme. Yes, yes. No time to die! Because oh, <laughs> he would fully commit to it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's why you know it would work. Um, I think... Calvin, am I correct in saying this is generally regarded as the worst Bond theme of all time? Well, it is by me. <laughs> really? I, I, yeah, no, oh, I hate it. I okay. absolutely, it's painful to listen to. Uh, I'm gonna, There's a I'm quantum particular... of solace. I'm gonna make a case for it then, okay? I... Okay. I think there's very few Bond themes. I think this is where we're different, Kevin. There's very few Bond themes that I would listen to outside of the context of watching the film. There's there's three or four of them that I actually like as, you know, songs. So most of them, it's just to set a mood and a feeling and um, capture the zeitgeist at the time. I think they're nice little time capsules. Like, oh, this is one of the biggest artists when this film was made. Let's hear their take on it. And... In the context of an opening title sequence, I thought this song was fine. I, I thought it was interesting. It had all the um, all these little interesting Bond-like riffs. I don't know how many of them were samples from previous bits of Bond score and how many of them were like new, completely new things that just felt very familiar. But like musically, I like it. But it is quite avant-garde and a bit jazzy in a way that someone like you who, you know unironically listens to Britney Spears might find upsetting. Um, <laughs> so I kind of get that. Um, Lady Gaga. But <laughs> they they barely even perform the song, right? Like, I've, I'm sure I've listened to this song before, and there's a lot of lyrics and, and verses and stuff, and the mm. copy last night, it felt almost like an instrumental version of the song. Like, someone came in and went, oh, I don't like those Jack White vocals. Can we do something mm. about that? Mm. They feel much more toned back in the in, in the version that's in the film and it is a little bit shorter than what was like you know the yeah. single anyway the the sequence itself it's weird isn't it it's james bond's walking through the desert and the desert comes mm. alive uh, alive like sandman from spider-man <laughs> and it's all these giant all these giant sand women come to life and like eat james bond and he falls uh, like <laughs> falls down and shoots a bullet and we see the bullet going and it does feel like a kind of someone who's doing a computer graphics degree, uh, and this is like their <laughs> final project. Like it's good, but it really should be better at a professional level. Well, this is not done by uh, most of them are done by most of the classic ones are done by Maurice Binder. Most of the modern ones are done by Daniel Kleinman. This is done by a company called I think it's MK two or MK twelve, something like that. The so, MK twelve, yeah, that Mark Forster brought in. Can I ask? Did they say? Can you tell us a bit about what the film's about? Like themes, ideas, just like locations <laughs> and things. 
because uh, obviously it's his animation it's going to take a bit longer to put together than just filming stuff um, and we need to know you know what we're working with and Mark Forster went uh, no we don't know yet sorry James uh, we, Bond we're, we're, we're two weeks into filming but we don't have a script we don't know what we're this film's about the desert um, I'm guessing they went look Mark you like stuff set in the desert so we're just going to roll with that and he, he went yeah this is as good a bet as anything that this will be you know, the desert's going to feature in this film and sand. I think they made this first and then he derived the <laughs> it. Now, my... Um, um, but on the on the topic of music, I do think this film has a really good score. Oh, yes. The score really jumped out at me. Uh, and maybe it's just because I was looking for something to guide me through the film and help me get <laughs> through it. But, um, you know, it's obviously David Arnold coming back. But I thought he's doing his usual thing but there were several new uh, lay motifs that kept coming in. I was like, oh, that's really nice, that. And some of them were, hmm. were you know, based on the song Another Way to Die. I, I, I really like when the kind of... Whenever that would kind of work into the score, it was really cool. Well, this is his last one as well to date. Um, really? oh. Which I, is a terrible shame because he's, yeah, uniformly uh, very good to brilliant uh, in these, but... Um, Alan, did the music, uh, the song, jump out at you much? No. Okay. Good. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, my next note that I made after Wait M Isn't Shot is uh, in capital letters, <laughs> I'm bored. So. <laughs> oh, dear. Do, do, do you know exactly where that was? Is this in the London sequence, or is it when we get to Haiti? I've written next to it with a hyphen, this Bond girl sucks. So I guess we've been introduced to, um, is it Camille oh. at this point? Camille, yeah. Um, well, what did you think of the totally born action sequence where Daniel Craig's fighting the guy in the hotel room? Where oh. it is just, it is like looking at Bourne, right, you want that. <laughs> I thought this. this is not too bad for Mark Forster, but it is blatantly ripping off the Bourne movies. Yeah, I had that thought. So we're, we're shortly introduced to the main Bond girl and the main villain, actually, of the thing. So I'm curious to know what you think of these two characters. Camille, played by Olga Kurilenko, let's start with her. She has her whole uh, backstory. She's wanting to get close to the general. Yes, who her backstory her is that her back is fucked up uh, in a fire <laughs> or something. Do they explain what that's about? Uh, well, it's hinted at. Later. I quite like that they don't make too big a deal of it here. Like, for a while I was like, oh, maybe that's just the actress. Like, I don't know what, do you, you know. Do you think that's intentional, or do you think it was cut from the film while they were making it? Oh, I I think it was most definitely cut. I mean, she does sort of explain that she was in a fire, or the family, you get the impression that it's a burn. But, I, yeah, knowing this film, it wouldn't surprise me if there was something more explicit that made that point that was cut, ultimately. While he's shagging her from behind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, darling, what, what's all this sh- all over your back? What's going on? <laughs> He's very sensitive. Well, Alan, what did, what did you think of uh, Camille? How did she, uh, you know, uh, compare to other Bond girls? Yeah, um, I think uh, as the film in general, just a bit too bland and nothingy. Uh, Th- there was nothing to her. I, uh, yeah, I was I was geared up to. Um, I don't know why, but I I f- was expecting Olga Kurilenko to. Be good. She seems like a capable actor. She, yeah, she's not a terrible actor or anything. I just think there's yeah. nothing there to work. Yeah, with. so that was it. I was very disappointed to discover that she's maybe the maybe the worst Bond girl ever. Maybe the least interesting one they've oh, ever had. No, that's that's crazy talk. But <laughs> yeah, what we just had with the last film with Eva Green, she's re- she was really good. It's a really strong character. She's a great actor. The and because they actually playing off each other and having emotions to each other worked really nicely. So then you're putting it in contrast to that immediately, aren't you? So you, mm. you, it, it's, a, it's a tough call anyway. And so apparently they just didn't try. Mm. Mm. But they sort of say she's a Bond girl. They don't shag, do they? No, they do not, actually. No, they kiss towards the end. But, that's but even it. that felt like he just did that because he doesn't know what else to do. Like, he doesn't know how to say mm. goodbye to a person or actually, like, say, like, shake their hand or anything like that. But I think what that was, mm. was they were, you know, halfway through filming and someone was like, oh, it's the last day for Olga Kirilenko today, guys. It's her, her final day. And then Mark Forster was like, shit, we forgot to put a bit in where they have sex. Forster? <laughs> Barely know her. 
<laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, though. Let's speak of uh, Matthew Alm- Al- Amalric. Is that what it is? Mm, Matthew Amalric, that... who is As the bad Dominic guy. Dominic Green. Yes, Dominic Green. Beautiful French name. Is he the, is he the main bad guy? Yes. yes. Uh, he's just not. He's just not good enough to be a Bond. Vi- he's just not. There's not enough there. Right. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Totally threw me. I realised that this was following on from the last film. I thought he was in the last film, and he. Wasn't yeah, I there. remembered he was in the last film. Was like, yes, he was kind of some sort of contact in the last film. He wasn't the main bad guy. He wasn't. I assumed he was. He wasn't no. In the that's last this film. is what I was thinking. I could remember scenes that he was in. I remember right, things happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I Same. remembered I was thinking of Munich. <laughs> uh, in which he and Drax are like these kind of secret bad guy yeah. people, and yes. uh, yeah, and but that genuinely, I was like, yes, I've seen him in this film, in Bond film before. He's from the previous film, and so I that had the same thing as you, and I yeah. haven't seen Munich. So what's that about? <laughs> I had the same thing, like, oh yeah, that's the that's the guy Mads Mikkelsen was, you know, working for, and we saw him, and blah blah blah. He was like on the phone, and then we saw his face at the end of the film or whatever. No, and, that and, was I, the guy and then at I the thought, start of the film. And then I thought, oh, so <laughs> that's why this guy is just not quite good enough to be a Bond villain because it's like they've inherited the casting of a you know like a B list mm-hmm. villain who wasn't really designed to fill this role. I don't want to throw this guy under the bus. I should add because I've seen him in other things and I I like him as an actor. He's just yeah. not. He's not the guy you, you... A Bond villain has to do so, so much heavy lifting uh, just because of how bad these films are. <laughs> and oh. he's just not... He's a guy you get in, like, an intimate little drama. He's not a guy you get in to steal the scene and make it work. And Well, I, I like him. I think there is, uh, as an actor I, in general, I think there is something a little bit sinister about him. I think you could get that out. He's kind of got a creepy totally. face. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I agree with that. And I think you could make that work, but yeah, you need to give him a character to but work But he's no on, Christopher like, Walken, is it? You can't just put him in a scene and <laughs> let that be it, like you can with Christopher Walken. And that's what they were trying to do, because he didn't have a script. They were obviously just going, right, we'll cast well enough that the actor is enough. And that's not what this guy mm-hmm. is. He obviously mm-hmm. needs, like, motivation. <laughs> Okay, so the plot is he's buying up land uh, and posing as some kind of, oh, I'm trying to save the world climate change thing. But it's Chinatown. Actually, They're doing Chinatown. But actually, yeah, he, well, we don't know what he's doing at this point, but we're under the impression that he's doing something else with all this land. He's, he's, there's a reason for it all, but it's probably mm-hmm. not oil. And uh, yeah, as it turns out, it's water. I, I read a quote going in that said they were inspired to do something like Chinatown. And I thought like, oh, interesting, interesting. Um, and then I was surprised to find out that by inspired by Chinatown, they meant they just ripped off Chinatown. <laughs> like, I thought they were using that as like a spiritual jumping off point. Like, oh, okay, so it's going to be something, you know, like you know, like he's in control of sewage works, but that gives him all this power. <laughs> no, it's literally just... He controls the water, and yeah. Well, I I kind of liked that it was quite straightforward, and that it wasn't like oh he's going to dissolve all the water with a space laser or whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and so that kind That's of works. That's the tuxedo, and then... isn't it? The Jackie Chan spy, <laughs> <laughs> and and the fact that it was then tied to kind of political corruption, the, the you know the the CIA. Uh, funding a, a coup, which is stuff that really happens, you know. I, I kind of liked all that, but there's a balance to be made where you need to make that dramatic, you need to make it filmic, and I just don't think they've quite found that. And to be honest, I think what you want in a Bond film is a bit of fun, and I know mm. the Craig era isn't playing up to that. Times have changed. I think, to be fair to them, I think you can make a dark, brooding Bond movie that is serious and devoid of fun. And again, to be fair to them, that is the directional shift they went in with the previous film. So to kind of build on that and push it further with this one makes sense. And we've had so many silly Bond movies up until now, I'm okay with that. You know, it's a pendulum, it'll go back there. With Casino Royale, you've, you've got like hard Bond but you can still flirt with a lady. Those Bruce Balls really did give a get little, a Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you can still give a little wink and a nudge and, and a kind of uh, have a have a good time. Whereas in here, because he's 
you know, and I appreciate his character development. He's been hurt, whatever. He's just brutal all the time, and just wants it's not to character kill development, though, is it? It's mm. literally the state he ends the previous film in, and they maintain it for <laughs> an hour and forty-seven minutes. But you, you, you just need to throw in like they they shoehorn in a completely uh, unvalidated sex scene with uh, Miss Fields. Like all you have to do is just let him enjoy that uh, because it didn't even feel like the point of that scene was he's doing this because it's all he knows and he's not enjoying it. It just felt like, oh, we should have a sex scene. Yeah, okay. Like, that's mm. that's the level it was working on. That is kind of what it's like when I have sex most of the time these days, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> we'll just get it done. Uh, sex and masturbation. It's just it's more of a compulsion. Like, oh, I've got to mm. do this. Well, that's why you've split up with your girlfriend. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of talking after that. I mean, that as well, but yeah, it's just, you know. <laughs> Well, should we um should we talk about the opera sequence then? Yeah, I, I so there's a scene in the theater where a load of people, very posh people, have congregated and been given little radio earpieces so they can all have a mm. conversation. Oh yes, hiding yes, in plain yes, sight. Yes. The problem, my problem with it is, is that they've chosen to do that in a theater in the middle of a show where mm. someone just mm. sat there talking to themselves. Is extremely conspicuous. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't know, Alan. I, I've been to a showing of Les Misérables, and there was someone sat in a wheelchair at the back who kept like screaming um, throughout the show. Blofeld. <laughs> <laughs> that that's obviously why they chose the theatre. It's the one place you can speak to yourself, and no one's going to notice. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, the, it's a place where you would speak to yourself when everyone go. That bloke's speaking to himself. You, know, look, you see that bloke over there? He's actually sat with someone. That's like his wife next to him, but he's not talking to her. Because he keeps saying stuff about money laundering. <laughs> I'm on Bluetooth, mate. I'm on, I've got Bluetooth in. Yeah. I like what this scene is trying to do, and it's obviously setting up this whole villainous organisation thing before they had the rights to Spectre back, so they have to make it quantum. Yeah, now what's that about, quantum? Is that from the books? Is that why the the no. short story was called Quantum Spectre of Solace? Of Solace didn't we? Because that is a terrible, terrible name for an organ. Like, at least Spectre is like, yeah, okay, it's an acronym, and it's obviously one they've worked backwards from, but at least it's like a decent spooky word, and Spectre mm-hmm. actually means something, you know, even though they wouldn't probably want to be calling themselves Spectre, at least it works <laughs> thematically. Whereas quantum, what? Like that, qu- quantum means an amount of something. Why would you ever yes. call an organization quantum? To, so that it works in with the title. That is literally the only thing. And that's not in the short story, I should say. Like the short story has very little to do with this. You could uh, maybe make a case for some kind of thematic resonance. Um, it's basically the short story is someone telling Bond a story about a married couple and how their marriage disintegrated and how you need to have a quantum of solace in a relationship to make it work or something like that. I don't really like the short story. But here the organisation is just called Quantum because they have the title and I guess they want to make it a, a, a literally apparent to the viewers why it's called that because it is, it's is—it's a really bad title. Calvin, um, mm. can I ask you a little question about the literary output of um, Ian Fleming? Sure. Yeah, he wrote Bond novels, but apparently he wrote Bond-based mm-hmm. short stories as well. Was that like for newspapers and stuff? Um, I assume there were some probably reused ideas and whatnot, but the shorts, they're kind of like a mixture of things. Some of them are publication from publications. Like, I think that Quantum of Solace okay. was something that he wrote for Playboy magazine, I <laughs> think. Um, I know there was one that he wrote for, like, Sotheby's, um, but a lot of them were when, in the 50s, they were potentially developing a TV show based on James Bond, and they asked him to produce some outlines for those, like, you know, half an hour, 45-minute ah. episodes. And when that didn't happen, he took those and repurposed them and made short stories out of them. Mm. This was not one of those. Like I say, this was a publication for another magazine. I can't remember exactly which one. But that's what a lot of the Bond short stories began life as. So was 007 in New York, which famously is all about <laughs> how to cook scrambled eggs properly and lists all the ingredients and everything. Was that just written for, like, a mm. cookery magazine? 
It was for something, I can't remember exactly what. I think it was some kind of magazine. Uh, but yeah, I can't remember exactly what, but yeah. I preferred that short story to Quantum of Solace. How many, what are the other ones? There's, what are the other the other names um, that they From use? A View to a Kill, Earth for Your Eyes Only, that's another one. Oh, so they, they have used all the names of the short stories as well. Uh, there are a few left. Risico is one, 007 in New York is another, Property of a Lady is another... Do you think they'll ever uh, go be, back yeah. to the well of official Ian Fleming titles? Uh, I think you could do Risico, because yeah. that's something that you can take and adapt into. It, Risico Definitely, can be yeah. anything. Property of a Lady, I think, is probably a bit too flowery. Yeah, I think but... you could have done that in the Judy Dench years, but now it's too late. Mm. Mm, yeah, mm. true. Yeah. 007 in New York ain't ever gonna happen. <laughs> Starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Well, that's it. Hercules did it. Well... Mm. Bond turns up at a house, and it's like, Mathis answers it, and he's like, alright, sorry about that torture stuff. Um, because I, re- that's what I remember about Mathis, he was in the last film, he was helping them out, and then all of a sudden, for no reason at all, Bond goes, Mathis, and decides that he's against him, he's a traitor. And that, as far as I could understand, was where the film ended for him. <laughs> So yes. it transpires that he, that Bond instinct was just total bollocks, and he was tortured for no re- good reason, as opposed to the good reasons mm. to touch people. I agree that it's a bit like Bond basically uses him to get a fake passport, to get to his next port of call, basically. Uh, and he just sort of asks him along on the mission. Because I he sees that he's like retired, and he's like, you know what, let's go out with a bang here. I owe you one. Yeah. Let's have an adventure mm. together. Some drinks. I'm an alcoholic. And then we get Strawberry Fields. Forever. When we get to Bolivia. So Stra- so Miss Fields, I believe she is named. Yeah. She works at the British Embassy in Bolivia, I guess. Something like that. Mm-hmm. She's mm-hmm. about 19 years old, so I don't know how she got that <laughs> job. She's dressed like a stripper on her way to a job uh, in a long <laughs> trench coat and boots with not- obviously nothing on underneath. That's what spies mm. wear, Alan. They wear long trench coats. Have you never seen like? Well, the is old that cartoons? is is this a joke that she's trying to play <laughs> spy, and this is like her idea of what a spy is, and she's obviously just some young intern that they've sent out to pick up James Bond. Yeah, she had a briefcase originally, but that got deleted. One of the many. She had a newspaper too. with two holes cut out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when originally when they filmed it, uh, James Bond walked up, and she said, like, you know. The weather in Stalingrad is very good this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this question, Calvin. If you were in charge of Bolivian British spies, whatever yeah. that, that company mm. would be called, and you thought, oh, we need to send someone to go and pick up James Bond, the famous philanderer. <laughs> Let's send the cute-as-a-button young intern who clearly has not mm. got the emotional maturity to deal with his advances, which... Let's with the most go basic... with the one named after a Beatles song. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, Calvin, do they only ever call her Miss Fields in this film? Yes. Good, okay. Good. Yes. Uh, the, you so have they, to wait they, until the end They recognised that it was stupid and worked around well, it. I accept that. I was extremely bored at this point in the film, so I, I went down a bit of a tangent here, just out of interest. Um... I looked it up, and certainly in England, from 1997 to 2019, I I couldn't get any earlier records than that, uh, there were three people (laughs) named Strawberry. uh, (laughs) And they were all in... Hippies. They were all in the year 2013. So I think it's people who watched this movie, but not at the cinema. They waited for DVD (laughs) a few years later. And they didn't actually watch the film, they just looked at the credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But I, I got very bored, so I was just looking up all the box. Because, you know, to be fair, it's not the most egregious not-a-name name that uh, we've had in these films. So, do you want to play a little game here? Okay. How many Bond girls do you think did not chart there was never <laughs> never a person <laughs> with that first name because it isn't a real name? How many <laughs> of them can you name? I'm going to tell you right now, there were six of them. Ooh, pussy. Okay. Uh, oh, pussy yep. is one of them. Yes. Christmas. Christmas <laughs> is one of them. Yes. I'm surprised there isn't a out. child called Christmas. Actually. Vespa. No, Vespa. Vespa is not only a name, but it's uh, on the rise, increasingly popular. Once this film came out. Ah. 
I think Vesper's a very old name that the film kind of revitalised. Mm. Solitaire. Solitaire is one of them. Well done. Calvin and Beaton. Ah. Yeah, Alan, Are you? Alan's got two to your one there if we're doing points, yeah. Oh, Jinx. Oh, yes, oh, well done, Alan. Uh, Jinx's real name is G- Giacinta. Uh, which, Jacinta. Jacinta, which is also not a name anyone had. I get two points for that then. Yeah. Ooh, um, plenty. Uh, oh, I didn't look up plenty. She wasn't on the list of Bond girls I was looking at. What's that about? Uh, well, she's a secondary Bond girl. Yeah, this is primary Bond girls only. I'm afraid. Well, Alan, Alan's one, unless you get the two remaining ones, Carmen. Uh, Kissy. Yes, well done, Kissy. And Spanky. Honey. Uh, no, honey is a fairly common name, actually. Yeah. Oh, octopusy. Octopusy, yes. Which I, I is that her real name? Do we just never learn her actual name? It can't be her name. Uh, yeah, no, uh, octopusy is her nickname, but uh, mm. yeah, we never find out what her birth name yeah. was. What film is that in? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Calvin, would you care to guess what the most popular Bond girl names are? The ones that are actually Ooh. realistic names for the other Charlotte. The spectrum. I did. I wrote yeah. down the top five. Emma. So you can do it like uh, Family Fortune. Samantha. Uh, Mary. Uh, yes, Mary was number five here, the fifth most common popular one. Oh, uh, Madeline. Uh, Madeline was number three. Yes, well done, Kevin. Stacy. No. <laughs> Kylie. No. Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you. Number four was Anya. Ah, uh, yeah. Which I think is more popular now, probably because of uh, Frozen. <laughs> Sadly, that's how these things work. Eve was uh, number two. Oh, okay. Eve. And overwhelmingly, the most popular name, like by a significant margin, was uh, a woman. Holly. <laughs> Holly? Ah. Holly Goodhead, right? Hmm. Yep, 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 correct. Holly Goodhead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, from Moonraker. It's not a real name. Well, that anyway, was interesting. Names. Yeah. Uh, but Strawberry is not a name. I, I will not accept three people being named Strawberry several Is there years a backstory the to that, Calvin? Why is she called She's got that? red hair. <laughs> it's a Beatles song. It's, she's got red hair. They didn't have a script. It's weird that there's no payoff, because she mentions at a couple of points, I think, like, he's like, oh, what's your name? And she's like, nope, it's just Fields. And it, it well, feels yeah, like it's you... a setup for a joke, but it's only yeah. if you pay attention to the credits you get it it's you'd, you'd think sean connery would come in and say you know the the, the curtains match the drapes or something <laughs> <laughs> a bit more on his level i've got a question calvin it was this name just for the film it's not from one of the books nope 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 none of the books Ugh. well fleming died before the beatles were a thing. i assumed it was from this one book doesn't like the beatles because you know, he mm, yeah. he put stupid names in the books. Yeah, but he hates the Beatles, and that was probably Ian Fleming who didn't like the Beatles putting it in. Oh, into actually, the... actually, no, I don't think the Beatles are mentioned in the books. It's in. Uh... But Ian Fleming was alive when they made Goldfinger, so he must have been alive at exactly. the Exactly, I reckon the that was. I reckon that was Ian Fleming going, oh, those dreadful Beatles. Put bloody yeah, Beatles. Say something about that. Oh, rock yeah. and roll music. I like the Rolling Stones. There's no way Sean Connery. There's no way James Bond likes the Rolling Stones. <laughs> They're way too cool for him. James Bond probably listens to like the fucking Everly Brothers or whatever they're called. Like the most, <laughs> the most boring, you know. Just no, J- James Bond would be into like Frank Sinatra and all those like crooners, wouldn't oh, he? Oh, Blue stuff. Asia's back. But like, was there a British Frank Sinatra? Because he probably wasn't that into the American stuff. Tom Jones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ding dong! <laughs> oh, lads. I heard you doing my voice, so I thought, hey, my ears are burning. <laughs> no, I was doing Tom Jones. Oh. Oh. Anyway, Lash, I'm not going to keep you long. I've not prepared a bit for you or nothing, so I'm just going to rattle off some uh, Patreon subscribers for you. Ah. Got some uh, some good old lads here. Just want to say thanks for uh, being on the old Patreon there. Good old lads. Bunch of lads. So, uh, huge massive thank you, lads, to uh, James Fleury. Justin Kilduff. That is a Bond name. Just, no, it, mm. just <laughs> Dominic Freeman. And uh, a great old lad here. The one, the only, Tom O'Fallows. Tom O'Fallows. Oh, oh thanks, Tom. And, and thank you, uh, Tomo, for the phenomenal 
opening theme music that you whipped up for this episode in the style of I'm just the white I'm just stripes. assuming we've had it at the start. Uh, uh, right? uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Thanks, Tomo. Um, as always, for your your music and thank you for your continued support. So, if you listener uh, would like to follow the lead of these guys. <laughs> Head over to patreon.com forward slash dim returns and get access to a whole load of shit. A uh, whole back catalogue of uh, Diminisodes. We are coming up to our special 100th ever Diminisode. We've got something really exciting planned for that. Access to the Diminishing Returns Discord, early access to episodes, loads of stuff. It's great. So head over there. Dead cheap and that. One pound a month is the cheapest. Three pounds a month for. Soul, 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 soul. That can't be right. That can't be right. It's oh, yeah, enough. you'll get. You'll get some enough. stuff for a pound a month. There's yeah. no way that it could be that cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get all our uh, classic back catalogue episodes as well, which, you know... That's crazy. If you're new to the show, and you're like, oh, I want to go back to the very beginning, start at the beginning, you can't. you got to go to our Patreon, and... You can't! We'll... <laughs> well, there's no need for that! <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks, Japanese Bond. Uh, if you are new to the show... Just like don't, don't like just go back and work your way through, and Japanese Bond will make sense. I promise. <laughs> yeah, All right, Lash. See ya. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye there. Bye. Right. Can we talk about my least favorite scene in the film, which is the whole uh, green party sequence, which is just green mind party. Caroline boggling. Lucas turns up. <laughs> Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, you know, I, was, I was I was trying to picture literally a green like you know celebration, and I was very confused by Calvin saying green party and then. Uh, so Bond and Strawberry turn up at Green's. Uh, he's don't, doing, don't, like, don't say Strawberry as a person. He's doing like a speech, and they're kind of walking through the crowd and stuff. And Green's doing his speech, but the uh, just the the editing, the direction, I like I lose all sense of geography on a relatively what should be an easy to understand space like out of nowhere you two were probably checked out at this point but yeah i was randomly, looking up baby names while this was happening <laughs> just the the geography of the left to right the crossing the line the, there's just a random shot of felix dropped in j- mm. in the middle of this thing and you're like oh is is felix there because that seems like, like that should be a yeah, big deal you know for listeners who maybe aren't knobheads who went to film school like we did like there there is a degree of science to cinematography arguably more science than art i mean all arts have science behind them but i think very much so with cinematography and part of that is just how you construct a scene and there's things like crossing the line which is to do with you know the movement of the actors becoming completely disconcerting and you have to be sure that you shoot and edit something in a way that doesn't confuse the audience and and there's methodology to it it's not just a shot in the dark and, and it doesn't feel like, mm. you know, you, you get films like David Lynch don't give a fuck. He'll break the rules if he wants. But, you know, he does it with purpose. Whereas this just feels like Mark Forster doesn't know how to make a film. No, I completely agree. Because it's like I'm complaining about stuff that can work in a different context if there's purpose to mm. it. Like the, the the psycho shower scene, for instance, is a, a 40, you know, 50 second flurry of edits and it might not make complete A to B sense to you when you first watch it, but it is a moment of horrific violence in a film and it, it works in that moment and it's it's justified. Whereas here, the sort of the flurry of edits in action sequences, it just doesn't work because it's a comp- you need to understand the A to Bs to Cs. Your eye needs to follow the logic of what's the, what the construction is, and it's it's just not there. And even in really basic like dialogue scenes, it's just it's not even there for those. It's it's quite baffling, really. Um, anyway, Mathis is dead. Whoa! Break it to me gently. <laughs> Can either of you tell me why Bond puts his body in the dumpster? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have cared. Yes, but why does he do it? Pay respect well, to Matt. What else are you going to do with it? Leave it on the you road? Can't just leave him there. Well, he can. Pay respect to the man. Chuck him in the bin. It, so it is just a. It's a burial where, with <laughs> limited means. It's a burial, but yeah. <laughs> That, that's not a burial! The bin men are going to come with their bin van and tip the thing upside down. And Mathis is going to be like be buried catapulted in the, uh, into the back of a, rubbish, of a <laughs> rubbish van. 
<laughs> like with a load of dirty nappies and rotten <laughs> apple cores and used condoms and driven to the tip where he's going to be picked apart by seagulls. <laughs> exactly, yeah. What it's the, a, the, it's the, a dignified <laughs> burial. He's not even hidden, like his arms fl- flying up the thing. It's not like, bon- I know Bond takes um, some money in his cards and stuff from his wallet, so okay, maybe he's trying to make it look like a mugging. But at this point, the police chief is in I on this I thought that was because M cut off his cards. <laughs> yeah, he was like, Ooh, well, well yeah, but it's it probably is that, because the police are already after Bond. We know this because they've killed Mathis. So it's not covering anything up. Like the, the the rest of the police are going to come surely and find that Bond shot their colleagues and everything, and Mathis is yeah, just in the but dumpster. It, it, it might buy it might buy him an hour before they find the body. You know, I mean, what? Well, it's right there. It's next to them. Yeah, but it, if you leave a body on a street, it's going to be found immediately. You chuck it in the bin. It might take a bit of time for someone. To but his arms hanging oh, an out arm of the dumpster. Out of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, you oh, see, okay. Math- Mathis was one of those guys who's like, oh, I'm not paying for a funeral, just stick me in the bin, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And James Bond was just respecting his last wishes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have, a, I have a question just before that, Calvin. At the Green Party. No, oh, okay. The woman who was seasick. Yes. That was the last time we saw her, right? Yes. And all of a sudden she's back with the Frenchman and yes. she's like, oh, hey. You, shall I tell everyone that you're a dickhead? And and mm. I'm just like, hang on, hasn't he already tried to kill her twice? What is she doing yes. there? <laughs> and I was really confused because then I couldn't remember the last time yeah, we saw women her. Women can be like that. She thinks she can change him, Alan. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I love a bastard. Uh, but no, you are right. That is, uh, yeah, I think she's still trying to get close to the general and this is her only way, so she'd rather risk her life here but it's yeah it's... yeah but then her way of doing that is obviously just to piss him off she's trying to ruin his business what does she think he's mm. going to do why yeah. don't she just go home and go to bed go to a therapist that's what she needs <laughs> deal with her traumas yeah mm. we have the uh golden girl is uh replicated here by oil instead <laughs> uh... be arthur <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it did raise the question. Have you ever had an oiled up woman on your bed? I have not. <laughs> have you? <laughs> well, oh, baby oil, yeah. Bit, bits of her. Oiled up, yeah. <laughs> never, I've never gone full head to toe in one, one go. But, yeah. <laughs> I used to do that a lot. I don't know why I don't do that anymore. Actually, it was really nice, the old, uh, the old baby oil. I mean, I'm going yeah. back to when I was like a teenager with that, but no, it was nice to. They don't even give you a proper shot of it in the film. It's really annoying. It's like the. Proper, like they, they do some kind of horrible dissolve, like a fading thing of the shots. It's all just really poorly done. It's all just very trying to be artsy fartsy. Yeah, you want to see a oiled up body nakedness. <laughs> what? So what was what was the point of that? It was just to make him feel bad, wasn't it? That yes, an innocent yes. woman was killed because of him. Yes, she was just a filing report. She had nothing to do with this, and you dragged her into this. She and, wasn't a fields uh, agent. No, no, she was not. Uh, so, but, what, then M, but why did they kill her with oil? They well, she tripped over uh, Dominic oil. Green's henchman at the party. No, why did they? I don't mean why. Did they, why did they kill her? I mean, why did they kill her with oil? Oh, because uh, as we know from James Bond, um, if you cover the skin in a substance, uh, <laughs> you will suffocate. Because apparently, we breathe through our skin, even though that's bollocks. That's fact. And gold is, you know, that was the old the old thing you had when you had money. But this is a modern bond. We had to update it. Gold's a bit tacky now, but, you mm. know, oil, oil is what rich Black people gold. have now. Black gold, exactly. So, yeah, just slather her in oil. It's more practical as well. I mean, you could actually drown someone in oil. I mean, that is actually... At least you can mm. shove them in a barrel of oil. But why didn't they drown her in water? And it's like a little hint to what their true thing was. That would have made more sense, for sure. It's not as visual, though, is it? It's cruel, no. though, isn't it? A bit yeah, mean to right. Bond. They're like, look, the, w- the only woman you've ever loved did this. What? We- oh, yeah. Because Ava yeah, Green she, drowned. She did. Oh, yeah. he watched yes, her yes. drown. Yeah, that's good. Yes. So if they're trying to send a message to it, that's a bit mean, even. By that's, the, uh, they, they've obviously they've, they've talked about it and gone, that's a bit much. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought, you know, when M had to go and report to, I don't know, the prime minister or someone. Mm, Tim Pickett Smith. He says, "What's what's your excuse now? Bond's gone blind." I thought that's a bit, 
bit insensitive to say to Judy Dench, isn't it? No, no, no. He says that Bond is legally blind. Ah, not the not not one of those illegally blind people, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to talk about the climax? Did you have any notes? Uh, oh yes, that? yes, yes. <laughs> to the left. <laughs> so that was Bruce Ball's bomb there, just having a nice Climaxing. climax. <laughs> yeah. Did you um, have any questions watching this? I'm, I'm assuming you were both really checked out, but this like, oh, hotel... completely. I, I, w- basically, what happened here was the film was on, then James <laughs> Bond said something like, "Oh, it's almost like a quantum of solace." Da-na-da-na-na. And I looked up like, <laughs> "What? That? What? That's it?" <laughs> and then I skipped back and watched that last scene again because I was like, oh, I had no idea that was the finale of this film. And uh, all the stuff at the hotel, all of it, everything. It didn't. I mean, th- nothing happened. There's there's some kind of brutalist building in the middle of a desert that has explosives oh. built into the walls. So there is a <laughs> desert. <laughs> That's it, right? Of the car park. I mean, yeah. My my notes here were just yeah. What. It's over, it happened, like, what happened, what was the plot of this movie? And and I, I went to Wikipedia to read the plot to try and, like, <laughs> make sense of it. And I had the exact same thing that happens with Lord of the Rings, where I just, I cannot get more than, like, a sentence into it before my brain just checks out. I, like, I cannot follow. So I don't know what happened in this film, to be perfectly honest. I, I watched it, it was on... <sighs> I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think it's the worst one, and that's saying something. <laughs> mm. We we get the conclusion of the story. The Frenchman is like, "Hey, look, we've made you the president of Bolivia. Now you're our bitch." The guy doesn't like it. He rapes someone. She manages to come in, get her revenge by killing him. Is this James Bond or Chinatown? <laughs> this is Chinatown now, right? That, that Forget is it, what James. Happens, it? <laughs> it's Bolivia. <laughs> So then, so yeah, but in the process of getting revenge, they blow up the building little bit by little bit. They're running out. It's fire. She's got post traumatic stress of being a child. Oh my God, he's saved her. Let's escape into the desert. The Frenchman is left in the desert. There you go. Yeah. And he gives him oil to drink as some kind of uh, ironic thing for Strawberry Fields. Mm. But little does he know that you can actually extract a fair bit of water from oil because, you know. That's what the moisture there is, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if he had the tools to do the experiments. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so that was all very pointless. But then we have the ending, the post-ending ending, which, of course, should be M phoning him and she can't have a good conversation with him because he's too busy shagging someone, which is the traditional <laughs> ending of a Bond film. Yeah. But instead, he goes and gets his personal revenge and, thing. Yeah, it should have been Bond shagging, and she's like, who's that on the phone, James? And he's like, oh, just my mother. And then it's, um, and <laughs> Mom? Hello, James Bond here, with a, a sexy woman between my legs. <laughs> oh, hello, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, <laughs> do you... <laughs> it's the most anyone's ever laughed at Bridget Jones. <laughs> I just, I oh, just appreciate that reference. You just plucked that one out. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's good, um, good work. <laughs> did, did you, um, know about the deleted ending from this film? Uh, there was going to be an extra scene Ooh. where Bond went to uh, kill Mr. White, who uh, was, of course, in the beginning of the film, the guy who uh, came back from... Didn't he get Royale. shot by, Wait, what, uh, were you still by David Mitchell at the beginning? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he, he, t- he turns up in the opera sequence. Oh, yes, yes, he was, yes. Yeah, and Bond was supposed to go after him, but that was removed, and that footage has never been released. <gasps> uh, what? Yeah, but it does change the canon a bit because mr white does return somewhere down the line but we will get there Ooh, mr white will return what about so what about the actual ending ending where he finds his ex-girlfriend's ex-boyfriend because he has a picture of him so he found him mm. and they retcon the last film so as i understand it the end of casino royale this woman who we re- respected and liked throughout the film Mm-hmm. We understand that she has made a, you know, a, a tough decision, but a noble sacrifice to save mm-hmm. someone that she loves. And now 
we retconned that so that she was actually just a bit of a silly little woman who was manipulated by a, a well-known liar, which actually does fit with the whole Bond relationship thing. Yeah, is is that a retcon? I think it works. It's it's more like a recontextualization. Of, yes, or okay. A confirmation that it's one thing and not another. But I think that option was always on the table, wasn't it? It was always like that could be what was. I don't think it was presented as this as a possibility. I think it works in the sense of we we didn't have to change anything, but it does completely recontextualize that character and really gives her a, a fuck you, if you ask me. And I didn't like it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, Alan. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I think I would have liked that had it felt like the film was doing it to make some kind of point or you know purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? It just feels like a kind of. Oh yeah, what can we do? Uh, that I guess. Yeah, I think they're grasping on to like this whole thing is supposed to be about his revenge, and yet th- there's no real tangible yeah. person to pin that on. Um, because Vesper effectively like killed herself, really. And, and yeah, this is the best that they can do, other than I guess Mister White, who they yeah. It's, it's a shame, isn't it? Because the idea of James Bond just going mental on a rampage based out of revenge, and they really actually get into it, and that is the whole film, mm. is quite cool and appealing. But mm. it's also like this is essentially this is the second Bond movie after they've like relaunched the series. They they reset it. So Casino Royale is square one, really. And mm. you know that's something you do with the character four or five movies in surely that it, it's just it's a bit weird to make it the idea for the second one and then mm. they don't follow through on it i think because of that because it's like well we still need to make a conventional james bond movie within this framework and it's like right well don't don't do that then because it you can't really do them together like mm. well wouldn't it have been better if he'd gone and searched this guy out and then he'd just been there and they went hey you were Eva Green's boyfriend. She died because of you. Mm. And then he would be like, yeah, I know. I feel so guilty. I loved her. She made a sacrifice for me. And then they just cried together, had a little bit of a hug. Hmm. Wouldn't that have been nice? Well, you know, if had that idea been written well, um, I, I, maybe I would have quite liked that. I don't like that mm. he has to be some kind of double agent. I hate this thing with some new woman that he's trying to dupe. And she's very easily convinced by Bond that he's like a wrong un. Um, it literally he's like, I don't even think she has a line I think she says mm. thank you on her way out the door and that's it it's like well <laughs> you, okay you didn't love him that much if your entire relationship can be swayed by one random bloke coming in but okay did you um did you like the Titanic moment a Titanic moment where Bond looks at the necklace and throws <laughs> it overboard <laughs> and again, that's a really clunky. You can just tell that that's an insert. Like, I don't think <laughs> it's like I... it's like watching old episodes of Thunderbirds where they'd cut to like human hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something to do with how you don't see him throw it, you just hear it, and then there's a shot of the thing, and Judy <laughs> Dench sort of looks a bit down. And I'm like, does she? W- when she was filming that, did she have any idea what this was going to look like? Like, was that there, or is this just? Uh... Yeah, their way of ending it, which, mm. ugh, gosh, yeah, no. Yeah, I really don't like this one <laughs> at all. Uh, and I rewatched it very recently in context. I had a bit of a Daniel Craig marathon. I watched them all in one day. Because um, this one's had a lot of recontextualizing recently, and I've read all the articles, I've seen all the videos, um, sort of defending it and stuff, and great points, but I just don't like it. I'm just seeing here what uh, Roger Moore thought about this film. Have you ever seen this, Calvin? I'm assuming you you know the line. Uh, I will have to, because I think it's from his book Bond on Bond, yeah, isn't it? He said it? James Bond should have Roger Moore. <laughs> women. Um, I mean, looking looking at this write-up of the reception on Wikipedia, it seems like all the positivity is about Daniel Craig as Bond, and then mm. everyone's kind of saying, like, well, but the film's a bit shit, but Daniel Craig was good. <laughs> I- but yeah, Roger Moore said there was a bit too much flash cutting, and it was just like a commercial. Mm-hmm. Mm. Even Roger Moore knows. There didn't seem to be any geography, and you were wondering what the hell was going on. So that's pretty much the same exact page as us. <laughs> yeah. I knew I liked Roger. Have you heard what Sean Connery said about it? <laughs> Go on. He should have slapped that strawberry fields for a start. She has given him too much lip. Is that Sean Connery as 
as he appeared on Bo Selector. <laughs> it sounded like you dipped into a Craig David voice there. <laughs> it must be my Yorkshire accent coming through. Oh, yeah, will we? Yeah. Oh, I did dear. see some people sort of like when Connery died, and, and I, I did see some people say, "Oh, he didn't even get a chance to see the new film," and I'm sort of like, <laughs> "He I hasn't never... watched one since 1972." <laughs> well, that's just it. I'm like, I'm not even sure he watched, it. yeah, <laughs> anyone that he wasn't in. I, mm. He didn't seem like a fan to me. <laughs> um, whatever. There's something of a growing sentiment, I think, of, you know, apologists starting to come out of the woodwork for this one who, you know, like, no, it's been mis- unfairly judged. And, and and that was part of what was, you know, making me think, oh, this might be the one that I really like then. Because, you know, I Casino Royale was so close to working for me. Um, it obviously fixed a lot of the issues that the franchise had for me. The only reason I didn't like Casino Royale was it was too long and bloated and the structure fell apart a bit at the end. So the fact that this is the shortest one ever, picking Mm. up immediately from that, and it's still, I mean, it's still not a short film, let's, you know, (laughs) um, I kind of thought like, yeah, this is going to be the one. This is the, 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 the black sheep of the family, but I do tend to like these more ambitious films that are trying to do something that maybe alienates some of their core fan base in the process, but at least they're trying to do something. But it isn't that, is it? It's just a bad film. And, you know, it's not intentionally alienating anyone. It's just badly made, even by James Bond standards. (laughs) Because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the franchise. And as I say, this is, this is the worst one. This (laughs) is a new low. Do you want to put a number on it? Oh, okay. We'll do uh, yeah, two out of ten. Ooh! Well, you know, you, you guys are really slagging this off. You hate it and you say it's terrible. I mean, I just... It just passed over me like a, a film. Like a it Bond was just movie. It was just a Bond film, yeah. So I didn't particularly dislike it. I didn't think it was any good. But it hung together. I understood what was happening, which isn't always the case. No, I and didn't even have that. The characters were fairly bland that they were doing the normal things. And I don't know. It was just an average mediocre film for me. I don't particularly care for James Bond at the best of times, but there's usually something in there. There's usually a character I like, and a couple of scenes that I like, and an actor that I like. This just had nothing. It was it was all of the bad and none of the good, with the exception of David Arnold's music. Uh, but yeah, sorry Alan, what, what would you give it out of ten? Uh, I give it a six. Ooh! Mm. I, just a completely mediocre film that I won't remember in two weeks. Yeah, but that's that's on the positive side of mediocre. Yeah, I think it just that's ticks all up. the boxes in a sort of fairly rudimentary way. Um, I I wish I could uh be on that same um level of thinking because there there are I, I do really love the music. I think the music is great, and I enjoy some of the action, even though it's it's so ineptly edited uh but that really is it that the just the the filmmaking itself irritates mm. me to my core watching yeah. this film and, and it's yeah. an issue that i have with um, every mark forster film i've seen and mm. i just know that i just don't like this guy's style i don't like how he makes films um his directorial style is just i incompatible with my enjoyment Anyway, it's a 3 out of 10 from me, which is quite low for a Bond film. I wow, think that's yeah. my lowest Bond Outrageous. score. But um, even, the Bond be, yeah. fil- even the Bond films that I don't like very much, like Dino the Day, for instance, there's still things in it. There's characters that I like. I, it, it can yeah. wash over me. This, I, this oh, just totally. doesn't wash over me. It irritates me. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> painful to watch. So there we go. Well, can I ask Calvin, how was this film received at the time of release? Um, at the time, it was fairly well received. Mm, uh, I don't think it was, was it? I, I know you well, loved it when you came out. I remember running into you on the street, and you'd just been to see it for like the third time, and you were like, <laughs> oh yeah, well, I had to go see it again, because last time I didn't stay to the end credits to see where it says James Bond will return. Uh, so I, I went to watch it again. I remember that. <laughs> Uh, yes, did you true. when you went back to watch it again to see that were yes. you expecting like the reveal of the name of the next film no 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 it's i don't know what i was expecting <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> what did you say that i'd seen it yeah because 
I think I think it got mixed reviews. Would be fair, but by franchise standards, I think it was pretty negative, muted, and I think a lot of people were a bit more positive and have gone negative like you because they were excited for another you know casino royale was such a big thing that people were excited for when it came out um mm. but no i don't i wouldn't say it was a positive reaction at all i i i would say it was quite uh middling yeah well even daniel craig did an interview recently where he referred to it as a flawed film <laughs> so was, uh, didn't he call it a quantum movie. of shite <laughs> exact words. Okay, I, before we finish, I uh, have another question for you, Calvin. Mm. So, as we all know, No Time to Die is never going to come out. Is <laughs> alleged to be coming out soon. Is there any kind of ritual? I know you're a very kind of weird person in terms of your things. You have to do things in a certain order uh, and at certain <laughs> times of the year, watch certain films and all that sort of thing. Obviously, you're a bit mental. So, do you have any specifics about going to see a new Bond film? The only thing that is specific, and this has sort of just been happenstance, really. Every time I see a new Bond film for the first time, it's with someone different. Oh. So. <laughs> and is this the first time it's not going to be with someone different? No, no. Um, I don't know who it will be. I've not booked the tickets so yet. You, so your boyfriend is... Very upset that you were refusing to. <laughs> yeah, but they've it. only been together for three years. It's been at least seven since the last film came out. Oh, yeah, that's a fair point. God, it actually point. has. <laughs> Who you go with is that important? Because I, I assume that first watch, you don't want to be distracted by someone else. You don't want them. Do you want a Bond fan there who's just going to focus on the film with you, or do you? If you have an outsider there, is that a stress on you? Uh, well, I was hoping you'd be free, actually. <laughs> to, uh, to, I think I asked you the last time I had a ticket booked, but you uh, were working, I think. Oh, really? When is it? Uh, well, it might be September 30th, uh, but the tickets haven't gone on sale yet, so um, I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. <laughs> so there, there's no ritual, then? Like, obviously, if you go, it's a busy audience. Do you, could you, do you feel like you need to be able to focus on it and take it all in? Or do you just think, oh, I'll go and see it three more times anyway, so that's fine? Well, the first time it does just wash over me, and I do like seeing it with a full audience because it is. And every, I think every time I've seen a Bond film, you know, uh, in, in the cinema, it has been quite a packed crowd. I tend to see it, you know, the day it comes out in the evening. Have they ever done? Um, do they ever do midnight releases for these Bond films, or are they not they quite big don't. enough? Don't, uh, or I don't think they have. Um, I mm. wouldn't go anyway, just because that. Not? Nah, it'd be too late for me. <laughs> I want to be in a good form for He's it. Got his hot milk by then in bed. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're just going to let it wash over you and have a kind of ethereal, dreamlike experience with it anyway, that's the best time to watch it when you're a bit trippy <laughs> now because you're tired. Well, no, I want to be sharp because then I need to go home and make a video about it. <laughs> are you, are you going to book a day off work for it? And is that I go, go at like have. nine a.m. and then? <laughs> He's already had five days off work for every day that they've said it was going to be released. <laughs> I've had time, yes, no, I've had time off booked every single time they uh, have a date. I've got three days off this time. I mean, I've done that to be fair. I, I took a day off work the day Super Smash Bros. Brawl came out when I was younger. Yeah, don't act better than me. <laughs> but to be fair, that's a video game, and I wanted to be able to play it all day. Oh, there uh, we go. Yep, there was the. <laughs> but I'm better than you, actually. <laughs> uh, but I did. I took a day off work the day after Avengers, whichever one it was. I went to at midnight and took a day off work after. It must have been Endgame, uh, mm. just because I was like, oh well, I'm going to watch it at midnight, so it's going to be like four a.m. before I go to sleep, and I'll just have the next day off to recuperate. It's a similar thing for me. I've taken this week off work just because. Just couldn't be asked with it, really. I thought I'll, uh -oh. I won't bother. That's good. <laughs> it's it's good that you're in a position where you can do that. It is. Yes, I'm a very privileged man. Yeah. <laughs> I really am. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank if you. You've, if you've enjoyed this, uh, arguably the most negative Bond episode we've done to date, but arguably <laughs> the most positive because Calvin and I are aligned for once. Yeah, isn't that, that's quite strange, really. Isn't that a Friends. nice... Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, if you've enjoyed this, head over to dimreturns.com and, and check out our 
huge back catalogue at this point of uh, other episodes. We've we've got loads uh, in the pipeline and recently with uh, exciting guests you may know other than Calvin. And um, there's about 200 old episodes that all have Calvin in them as well, including all the old James Bond ones. And you know what? If you have enjoyed this, give us a like and subscribe, because that's always nice. And it really does help us out. Yeah. So, yeah on the old Apple Podcasts app there, or whatever you use, just uh, give us a little rating, a little follow. Thanks. 